Extras. The sea elves were once a significant underwater civilization, renowned throughout the oceans for their art and culture. Physically, they're very similar to Eladrin, ex except for the addition of gills on their necks. As such, they're not considered particularly strong swimmers or warriors, and thus do not rank especially high among the slave races of the Diluvian Empire. But the Kuator are not stupid, and some of their leaders are well aware that any sort of peaceful communication with the land dwellers is better delivered by a face and a voice that is more pleasing to them. As such, owners submit sea elves for testing, and based on their intelligence and linguistic skills, a ruling house may buy some of the slaves in order to train them for diplomacy. Of course, such diplomatic missions are rare, so the co competition is fierce among the unfortunate servants, as it is one of the only ways they can earn a better standard of living and a small measure of respect within the Empire. A top-of-the-line trained envoy, like Rollo, must still show deference for even the lowliest Kuatoa peasant, but there is no question that his value to his owners is much greater than that peasant, and as long as he behaves in accordance to his station, his life is relatively luxurious, until called upon for a mission. Rollo in particular belongs to House Valoon, considered the most powerful of the great houses, and certainly one of the wealthiest. Valoon is the house of the priesthood. They enjoy a special status within the theocracy, where members of any house who display a divine gift, the ability to channel Blabal's power, can be claimed by House Valoon according to ancient law, so that they may be trained as priests or as paladins. There is another ancient law from the earliest beginnings of Diluvia, back when it was not an empire but a mere ambitious city-state, a law which decreed because it is the duty of the priests to select the leader of the tribe, their great family, which later became the great House Valoon, could not choose one of their own as leader. However, in recent centuries, this one simple limitation on their power has become almost meaningless as they scout and groom future candidates for emperor to the point that although the individual comes from another house, he is considered by many to be a puppet of the clergy. This was one of the many grievances which led the Illud to rebel against the Empire, and you can see it clearly when such a rare diplomatic mission, directly from Emperor Kulrov, is using an envoy trained and selected by House Valoon. In theory, Rollo should look very attractive, and his voice, words, and expression are all well crafted to be charismatic. But since my chibi version was going to turn into a caricature anyway, I opted to make him look as smug as possible. I wanted you to look at his face and just want to punch it. And in practice, the Diluvian idea of charisma is a little tainted. Really, his job is to remind them with every word that the Emperor has all the power, and these humans would be fools not to embrace his generosity. Upon hearing the specifics of the Diluvian peace offer, the king in exile of the people of Verandi stated in a dire tone that whether the king of Istria, the one with the real power, accepted the treaty or not, either decision would divide the remnants of the Verandi people. In the already dense episode, there was no room to explain what he meant, though I'm sure some of you can guess. The core of the peace offer was that the Diluvians would return a quarter of the conquered lands back to the humans. Obviously, this would be quickly embraced by many of the people whose ancestors hailed from that area, particularly the noble families who, like the Marquis of Rowan, would regain their fiefdoms. But that leaves, one assumes, about two-thirds of the refugees whose situation would be very unclear with their lands still in enemy hands, would they be crammed into the repatriated region, or would they remain stranded in the camps in Vistria, and would even that limited support be withdrawn by the native Vistrians, assuming that the Verandi people could now take care of their own? Many of those people, and at minimum a loud minority of Vistrian nobles and citizens, would be angered that the Crown had effectively agreed not to fight the Diluvians any more allowing the devils to keep the majority of their ill-gotten gains. On the other hand, refusing the offer, even if the empire did not exact vicious retribution, 
The people who could have returned home under the treaty would understandably be furious, and a great many war-weary people of both nationalities would despair at the king's rejection of an apparent respite from the stressful, ceaseless war. Whatever other purpose lay behind the peace offer, it would be hard to have calculated a more effective way to pry at the fault lines beneath the surface of Istria's society. So, in this particular circumstance, not fighting the Monitor was almost certainly the wiser course, even though I'm quite confident they would have defeated him. In addition to messing around with their currently excellent reputation, I think they underestimated the amount of casualties that would have resulted. I can't tell exactly how the fight would have gone, but I had planned for the possibility of battle with Diamond Fin Coda. Had Little One started, presumably with a powerful martial strike, the Monitor would have tried to dodge the attack, and then would have actually tumbled away, leaping onto the wall on the lower side, the side opposite from where Draven, Black, and Zaheer stood. Landing up there, he would have used the ballista throw maneuver to hurl one of the soldiers along a sixty-foot line with such force that the impact would have killed every crossbowman on a large section of wall, toppling them like dominoes. This is not just a big, impressive, monstrous first move. It's actually strategic. Coda's AC was quite good, good enough that one or two or even ten regular crossbowmen posed no realistic threat to him at all. But one of the house rules I added to the campaign is that if any target is subject to a large number of attacks in a single round, it becomes more and more likely that they will get hit, even if the individual attackers are unskilled. By this rule, if you are attacked by three different characters in the same round, nothing changes. But starting with the fourth attacker, all other attackers in that same round gain plus one to hit against them, and for every third additional attacker, this bonus increases by another plus one, with no cap. Because of the numbers required, this only really comes up when large units of ranged attackers are involved, and I usually forget to implement it on those few occasions when it would affect the party. But I find it's an important rule to have, because it helps explain why, despite their reputation, you very rarely see a monitor or an orc actually take on a genuine army single-handed, especially on open ground. If you are fighting 30 archers, and they all focus on the same target, by that last archer's turn, he's getting almost plus 10 to hit. If you go up to 40 archers, the last 10 of them are all getting plus 10 or more to hit, and by the time you hit 50 or 60 crossbowmen, as in this situation, even if Coda had an AC of 30, the last 10 shots would be hitting at least half the time, even if the soldiers started with no bonus at all, which is unlikely. So, for all the Monitor's fearless confidence, he knew his first move had to be either to get into cover, or to eliminate about half the archers, reducing the volume of incoming fire to an amount he could comfortably block or dodge. And that's assuming nobody breaks ranks in terror, seeing their comrades on the lower wall wiped out in a matter of seconds. From that point, it's near impossible to extrapolate how the fight would have gone, given five players, six characters who I don't control, plus countless die rolls, more NPCs than I can handle, and a pretty good toolkit of options for the monitor to respond. But I know that the huge golem, which could reach the lower battlement reasonably well, would have tried to smash the monitor, and as he dodged away, the golem's misses would have smashed big chunks out of the wall, much to the consternation of any PCs who had followed him up there. Coda had some of the best lines, too. I love pretty much everything he said, which is why it all made the cut for the episode. But if the fight had happened, partway through, as the NPCs evacuated the royals and most of the skilled combatants in the court retreated with them, Coda would have mused to the heroes busy trying to hit him, Those fools are protecting the wrong person. I was specifically ordered not to harm the kings. Would it not be hilarious to leave the two of them quivering alone in this fortress? Maybe I'll find out whether the Emperor has a sense of humor. Which is both funny and a little scary, but it also hints at some interesting undercurrents of 
the Diluvian leadership's relationship to monitors. Coda was ordered not to attack, but whoever gives the orders clearly knew he might try to circumvent them, and instead of tightening the order's wording to avoid this, they gave this seemingly redundant secondary order. The party never did find out if the shooter had any motive other than being a bigot with a crossbow. Then again, sometimes history is changed not by great men, but by a bigot with a crossbow. As you probably gathered from episode 23, the sickness caused by the actions of the cultists was actually caused by the scarabs. But obviously, if it was described as a sickness, the flying beetles weren't shredding the flesh of infants. Rather, the incense attracted a small number of scarabs to feed, each draining a small amount of blood and returning it to their colony down in the sewer, where they would secrete the blood along with another substance to create the green goo, which they used both as a means of storing and preserving food, and as a medium within which they plant and nurture the numerous small eggs laid by their much larger queen scarab, who was bricked in on the other side of the back wall. When any other creature disturbs the goo, or gets hit by it, the scarabs viciously attack to defend their food and eggs, trying to recover goo in the process, although they generally don't switch to recovery until the offending creature is dead. But, for example, when shovels were used, the beetles would fly to the shovel head, find it quite unalive, and simply start recovering goo as though a tree branch had fallen in or something. I did slightly mix up the game effects scraping off the goo in the video. I found the right notes later. The rule was that you take 1d6 per shovelful per round. If you had multiple stacks, scraping it off would reduce it to a single stack, so just 1d6, or if you were already down to 1d6, you would scrape it off completely. If they had lit the incense in the crates, that would have signaled all the scarabs to change from kill to suck, reducing the damage to only one per stack. In any case, the party took down this Cornello cult without much fuss. If they wanted to keep it a secret, maybe they shouldn't have used symbols tied to that vampire king and, you know, shouted his name at the outsiders. If you like hearing me talk, you ought to subscribe to my Twitter, at TalesDDC, and for my occasional longer posts, check out demonac.tumblr.com.